look at 1 John today, 1 John chapter 5. We're going to look at just a couple of verses to start with, um, verses 4 and 5. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And so we have that short statement in John about the ability that we have to overcome this world. Remember, the world in this context is that system that's against God, that power that's against God, that influence in our life that's all around us and, and even something that we battle within ourselves um, to go against God and God's plan and God's purpose for our lives. And we can overcome all of that um, through our faith. And, and that's what we've been talking about. So we've been ex examining this idea of this faith that overcomes, an overcoming power of faith. Um, John here in 1 John talks about this type of faith that God wants us to have. This is what God desires for us, where we can overcome the world. Uh, we've seen that this faith has a strong conviction and trust in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. He is the way, the truth, and the life, as he states. He's the only way that, he's the only one who provides that way to God and to eternal life. We grow in this faith, we grow in this trust as we gain a clearer view of who Jesus is as, as he's presented by the word and also his involvement in our lives. And remember, um, we've talked about faith is a life-changing event, not just a momentary decision that we make, but it, it changes our lives from that day forward. And also that faith that we have is built on this foundation of the faithfulness of God. We, we need to remember that as we think about our faith. Again, not so much gaining more faith, but have a clear understanding of how faithful and trustworthy God is. You know, as we think about God, Scripture shows us that he knows everything, that he has complete power, plus not only that, he has that love for us and he wants the very best for us. And so by faith, we look at those attributes of God and we look at the events that are going on in our lives and we try to put those together to have an understanding of, of what God is doing and, and that we can truly trust him. I mean, you think about it, if, you are, if you're lost and you uh, pull over and ask somebody for directions and they say, well, you know, I'm not quite sure this place that you're trying to go to, but you know, I think if you do this and turn right on this road and turn left on this road, I think that'll get you there. Um, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of confidence um, of following those directions, maybe not even doing that. Now, if you use a GPS, you have that trust that the GPS is going to eventually get you there, right? Some, are, some mess up, now, but you know even that, because sometimes we don't have confidence, that it starts telling you to go one road, and you're going, no, I know that's not the best road, and so you just, you know, you um, overrule the GPS, and she keeps talking to you um, and telling you to do something else. But, um, uh, but you know, so, so we, you know, you find, you find things in life that you can trust, and you're going to believe them and follow them, but things that you can't trust, you're not going to believe it. And if, you know, if you have some doubts, you're going to have some hesitation along the way. But we can trust God completely because he is completely trustworthy. And this faith that we have will help us overcome those obstacles in life, things that we go through. And there's a variety of obstacles that will trip us up um, in our lives and, and will hinder our growth and our, our ability to follow the Lord. And so we, we're going to look at some of these over these next few weeks of these obstacles that we can overcome by faith. Today's obstacle that I want to look at is the, um, the problem with sin. We have this obstacle of sin. And so let's begin with that first idea, the, pro the problem of sin. So what is sin? Well, sin means to miss the mark. That's what the, that's what the word in Greek means. It means to miss the mark. So if, if you're a shooter and you shoot and you don't hit the bullseye, you've missed the mark. If it's, you know, if, if, um, if you're trying to complete a certain task a certain way and don't complete it that particular way, you've missed the mark. Um, um, sin is not reaching that standard that God has set. So God has set standards. If we don't reach that standard, that's sin. Sin is doing those things that are against God's rules or commands. Um, Jesus, and, and saying things that are against God's rules or go against God's rules and commands um, Jesus even points out that thinking about doing these things is sin. 
So, you know, and he had to deal with that because of the context of the people he was around. They had this outward view of following God and not inwardly. And in the Bible, there are plenty of lists of sin. So if, if you just start searching through the New Testament, you'll see different lists of sin. Now, um, I'll just give you one example. It's out of Galatians 5. I'm going to read it from the common English version because when you start looking at some of these words, like in the New American Standard, they're words that we just don't use and, and maybe don't have a good understanding of what, they, what that actually means. So here's from the common English version in Galatians 5. The actions that are produced by selfish motives are obvious since they include sexual immorality, moral corruption, doing whatever feels good, idolatry, drug use, and casting spells, hate, fighting, obsession, losing your temper, competitive opposition, conflict, selfishness, and group rivalry, jealousy, drunkenness, partying, and other things like that. Now, when you read a list like that, um, uh, you know, one of the things you might do is say, oh, well, I don't do any of those things, so I must be okay, you know. The problem is um, there are more than, there's more than one list, and so you have to go through all of Scripture and look at all those lists if you want to have this, you know, this understanding. And another thing to do is go through the New Testament and just start finding the commands and rules of God that are presented in the New Testament and say, am I following these things? Am I doing what God wants me to do? And then the other thing that you can do is at the end of this particular list, and this is the reason I use this one, is Paul finishes with and other things like that. So he's not saying this is a complete list. This is just a partial list, and there are many other things that we need to avoid in our lives. And, you know, we can, we can figure out, and again, that's the, the beauty of having the Holy Spirit live within us, that, you know, when we do something that's against God, we're going to be prompted by the Holy Spirit of, about, uh, about that. So with sin, we normally think about the bad things that we do. But James says, the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. And so we have to understand that sin isn't just doing bad things. Sin is also failing to do the good thing in our, in our lives. They, they, they give the, these words, the sin of commission, where you commit the sin, and the sin of omission, where you omit doing the thing that you needed to do, that God wants you to do. And so we have to look at it in, in both ways. And again, part of the problem with sin is that we try to downplay the, the effect of sin and the, and the seriousness of sin in our lives today. I read this interesting little reading about sin. So what is sin? Man calls it an accident. God calls it an abomination. Man calls it an error. God calls it an enmity. Man calls it a liberty. God calls it lawlessness. Man calls it, calls it trifle. God calls it a tragedy. Man will call it a mistake. God will call it madness. Man calls it a weakness. God calls it willfulness. So we can't skirt the issue. We need to make sure we're very clear in our understanding um, about sin and, and we have all sinned. I'm just quoting scripture, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So find that glory of God, understand the glory of God, and when we fall short of that, then we have sinned. So we are all guilty. You know, when we get a good grasp and a good understanding of the holiness of God, then we will, then we will start seeing the evilness of sin. But if we start just looking at it as how everybody else says, talks about it, how the world talks about it, how we want to think about it, then we're going to downplay how evil and awful sin is. But when we start seeing it through the eyes of God and, and through his holiness, then we will, we will recognize how evil, evil it is and we will fight harder to battle against sin. Not just giving in, not just justifying, not just making excuses, but actually doing something about it. So our sin, the Bible teaches us, makes us guilty. We have violated God's law. We're accountable to God as a result. And the price of this guilt is death, the Bible says, that eternal separation from God. But sin also makes us emotionally guilty as well. We know that we have sinned, and so we seek to kind of run away from and hide from God, just like Adam and Eve did, because of our sin. We don't want to get closer to God uh, because of that barrier of sin 
in our lives. So there's an emotional guilt that goes along with it as well. And if we're not careful, then we'll just become hardened to it. We're, uh, we just won't let it have an effect on us. Uh, and then as a result of that, that state, that situation, then our relationship with God is going to suffer as well. But the guilt's there whether we believe it or not or want to, want to believe it or not. So unless we can remove the guilt, then we're not going to have comfort, we're not going to have peace, we're not going to have that strength that God provides to us. He wants to give us all of that, and, that, and the, the barrier to receiving that and living that life is, is our sin and, the, and, and if the, the guilt of that sin. So obviously, sin is a problem. There's that problem of sin. But there's another obstacle um, that has to do with sin that we need to look at as well, and that is the power of sin. You know, we, we shouldn't be under the power of sin, but we recognize Scripture talks about that power of sin. And, and sin has the power to enslave a person so that they don't want to do what they should do. So it all of a sudden just changes your life. And when you see that word slave, that word means that that person is under the master, under the rule and direction and the power of somebody else. And so if, if we become a slave to sin, then we are under the rule and the power and the decisions of sin. Jesus had a conversation with some Jewish people in um, John chapter 8, and he told them that those who sin become slaves to sin. And then he told them the good news that if they would put their faith in Jesus, that they would be um, free, set free. All they had to do is believe, and then some more conversation went as a result of that. They didn't want to, they didn't want to do that, and, and there, the conversation went on. Uh, Paul talks about this power of sin in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. So we see the, the plan of God here. We've been set free to live in freedom, freedom from sin, okay? But he says, don't, don't be subject again to sin. Don't give, don't give in to it again. You've been set free from it. That's God's plan. Um, and don't give in and become under that yoke of slavery where sin has put its yoke on you and it guides you, just like, like the farmer would guide the ox um, with the yoke, so sin... Uh, would guide you with that yoke as well. If we don't overcome the obstacle of sin, then you place that yoke upon you. You're stuck in its power. And let's not minimize the power that goes over us when we just submit to sin. Um, it's a terrible thing. It's like a powerful drug. Um, you may think that you're in control as you take this drug, but then after a while, all of a sudden, you're not in control, and you're addicted, and, and you do all that you can to get this drug um, because it, it has control over you. Now, Dick, Dick Beardsley is not a well-known person, but for those who know him, he became famous back in 1982 in the Boston Marathon because it, it was an incredible race with Alberto Salazar. The two of them throughout the entire marathon and Dick Beardsley came in a very close second place um, in that marathon. They wrote a book about it. Um, it was just such a great, great event. But then after that marathon, when he thought, okay, things are starting to go well in my life, um, his running career ended because of some injuries, and so he had to go back to what he knew before running, and that was farming in Minnesota. So he moved back up to Minnesota, and on his land up there, and he started farming again. That's, that's what he knew. On a terrible, terrible day, he was, he was involved in an awful accident. Um, he had his tractor running with the PTO drive going, running a piece, piece of machinery. You know, there's a shaft that's spinning. And as he was working, he got his pants got caught in that shaft. And if you've seen that sort of thing, you know that it's spinning very quickly. And he was just, he was sucked into that shaft and just flung round and round and round. Couldn't get off. He was just going round and round. Finally, the, the pressure that bogged down the tractor and the, the engine shut off, but obviously he was horribly injured um, and scarred for life as a result of this accident. But the biggest problem from that accident 
was the prescription of Demerol. Um, that drug immediately, for him, took that pain away, uh, made him feel good, even better than before, and um, it didn't take long as he kept, kept taking this Demerol and having other little situations where he needed to take Demerol that he was addicted um, to it. And then his life spiraled downward as all he did, his whole focus of his life was try to figure out how to get fake prescriptions so that he could get more and more of this Demerol. So he was under the power of that drug. And finally, through help of friends, he was able to overcome that addiction. But, but during that time, he was under the power of that drug. He, he couldn't make the right decisions because of that power. And as we think about sin, sin does the same thing. Um, we've been set free by Christ to live in freedom, not to be under the power of sin. And so when we start saying, well, just a little bit of this or a little sin here and there, and we start giving ourselves um, permission to commit sin, then before we know it, we're going to be back under the power of sin, even though we've been set free not to be enslaved by sin. So don't let it control your life because there is a power in it. So we've seen obstacles of the problem of sin. We've seen the obstacles of the power of sin. But that's just all the bad news. We need to talk about some good news this morning, and that's the help that we have so that we can overcome these obstacles. And that brings me to my third thought today, and that's the provision from Jesus. We have a provision to be free from all of that. God offers provision. That provision is Jesus. This scripture is very clear about that. Jesus provides the forgiveness of sin. God provides us the power so that we can overcome sin and not live in it. In um, Acts chapter 10, Peter in his sermon says something very important, Acts 10, 43. Of him, speaking of Jesus, of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. And when we are forgiven of sin, we are get forgiven of the, the debt of sin and the guilt of sin and all that that goes along with it. We've been forgiven of all that and the power of sin. And so we don't have to be under um, sin's power. That comes through Jesus Christ. His blood is what makes us justified, declared not guilty, and therefore spared from the wrath of God and given this new lease on life and the opportunity um, to live the way that God wants us to live. And so Jesus provided the forgiveness of sin. And we take that step of faith, because we're talking about faith, we take that step of faith and we believe that promise that comes from Jesus. And that faith will cause us to confess Christ. And that faith will lead us to repent from our sin. And that faith will prompt us to be baptized into Christ. And that faith will empower us to rise up and walk in that newness of of life. It's that faith that overcomes, that faith that overcomes sin. Now again, it's not something that we generate within ourselves. It's something that we believe and we receive. And when you truly believe the message, that you truly believe the promise of God, then you will be able to defeat the problem of sin and you will be able to defeat the, the power of sin. But we have to believe the message. We have to believe uh, what God has promised us. And Jesus provides that power over sin. In Romans chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, Paul says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. So there's our promise that Christ has given to us that we are free from sin. We don't have to be a slave to sin. If you think you have to be, then you're believing a lie. The truth is that we have been freed from that. We have the power over that, and that's what we need to believe, and that's what we need to live in our lives. I mean, we can think about it and say, yeah, I believe that, but do we live it? Do we live that every day of our lives recognizing sin has no power over me because I have the power of Christ within me to defeat sin. Remember, Jesus is the one who's overcome this world, and we have that peace and that power that comes from him. So to the one who's willing to believe in Jesus with a trust and a conviction to do what he says, then you have that faith to overcome. Again, not that you made that faith, 
but you have that faith because you're focused more on the object of your faith, and that's God and his faithfulness. Um, you can have that faith to overcome sin. The Lord expects it, and he empowers us to do it. You know, the, as, as he calls us to succeed in our life through faith, I think about Peter. Now, Peter embarrassingly denied Jesus three times. I mean, that had to be the most embarrassing thing that Peter had ever done. Um, yet, Peter still ran to that empty tomb on Sunday morning uh, to, to see what had happened about the resurrection of Jesus. On another day, when he was in the boat with his, his fishing buddies, Peter jumped out of the boat and swam to shore because he saw Jesus on the beach as, as he had called out to them. He had recognized Jesus. And this same Peter became a great leader in the church as he, as he was that apostle who gave that first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2. And when this first half of the book of Acts, you see about all the things that God did uh, through Peter. He could do that because he, by faith, overcame the obstacle of sin. He had sinned and, and, and rejected Jesus, and yet by faith he overcame that obstacle of sin, and he believed, and, and he overcame the power of sin, and he was used by God in a mighty way. And so that's our call today, so that you can overcome the problem and the power of sin by trusting Jesus, by having faith in the work that he's done, and by having faith in the promises that he gives, that promise of power. We have a faith that overcomes. Let's pray. Lord, again, thank you for um, your word and thank you for the promises that you give us and especially this promise to overcome sin. Lord, I don't know what everyone in here battles with, but we all battle with something. And I pray, Father, that you would um, remind us um, through your word and through your spirit that um, we have that power um, in this battle to stand firm and succeed, Lord. To, to have that victory. So I pray, Father, for that victory through faith, that faith that overcomes. In Jesus' name, amen.